Hello. We live in a time when our idea of community is frayed, strained due to our busy lives, challenged by the political landscape, and competing responsibilities. Some of us believe that getting involved will not change anything. Fortunately, however, there are many people in our community who are doing something about the conditions in which we live. This program will show you that one person can make a difference and that the power of one is within all of us. Welcome to the power of one. Tom, thank you for being here today. I want to introduce you to the audience. Uh, Tom thank Wiggins you. is a um, lead test driver for one of the largest, uh, uh, I guess, testing firms in, mm -hmm. in the Not entire country. Yep. Uh, so it's great to have you here, and um, you're a resident of Pasadena as well. Yep. So um, that's what this show is all about, um, showing that people here are making big changes. And yours is a little bit esoteric. Right. It's a little bit bizarre, and that's why I really wanted you on the show, because one, what you do is rather unique, but then two, um, what you're doing it for is really unique, but it's also um, important. It, it, there's a, a great amount of, um, I would say, uh, potential positive outcomes that could um, come from what you do. Absolutely. So, so, what is a test car driver? I mean, when a lot of kids are 10 years old, they're thinking, oh, I want to drive cars for a living. Um, what do you do? What, what do I it? do? Um, well, to back up, I work for an engineering firm that provides test drivers to all the major automotive manufacturers. So domestic, mm. Asian, European, any given moment, we probably have four to 600 test drivers on the rolls. Most of those people mm. are project-based. There's a small handful that are staff. Um, I'm permanently tasked at one of the large automotive manufacturers. I both am a test driver and manage a group, um, specifically in the hydrogen fuel cell arena. So I started out in the high performance side, probably what 10 year olds were more in interested in. Yeah, so that's like McLarens and Lamborghinis. Yes, so and McLaren was a client, Porsche was a client, mm -hmm. so I used to drive those. Aston Martin? Uh, not mm -hmm. Aston Martin. No James Bond? No James Bond, no. Um, but uh, I've been into cars since I played with them as a kid, Hot Wheels, but yeah. I've always had a, an interest in environmental issues, and so I've been doing this for about 10 years. It's a complete flip from what I did before. I was mm -hmm. in the finance world, worked for a large Wall Street firm, was a hedge fund trader, things completely Hence the bow tie. Hence the bow tie, completely unrelated to driving. Yeah. Uh, but cars have always been my hobby, mm -hmm. and that's always what I did on the side. I've driven over a million miles. Um, and when I got into test driving about 10 years ago, it was on the high-performance side, like I said, Porsche and uh, Claren, the AMG division of Mercedes. Uh, but having that environmental interest, I kind of always wanted to bring that into what I was doing in the test driving world. So I started a few years ago with hybrids and then uh, plug-in hybrids, battery electric vehicles, that type of thing. About four years ago, moved into testing hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and have been doing that full time for about three years. Great, so <coughs> let's talk a little bit about um, the hydrogen. And sure. So I think a lot of people have some misnomers, and especially if you've seen anything like um, one of those Zeppelins uh, right. explode. Um, Not during, personally, but I've yeah, certainly read about it in history. <laughs> yeah. so, so why, how did they make hydrogen to be a viable fuel? And um, Well, the interesting thing that I didn't realize until I got into the business is that hydrogen predates the internal combustion combustion engine. So a lot of people think, ooh, it's new technology. Yeah. Actually, you go back to the 1800s, the first working hydrogen fuel cell was about a decade roughly before the first internal combustion motor. Um, and you th think in terms of reliability, if it can put a man on the moon, which is they used fuel cells to propel those rockets in the 60s, it can certainly get, get you around the block. So if you kind of you know, go out a little bit bigger and look at it from that perspective, it's older, it's been proven reliable in space, it's been proven reliable in you know, industry and actually automotive applications for a long time. They've been riding, for example, buses in Japan for quite some time, in Palm Springs, actually, uh, come to think of it. Uh, those have been running for years, the, uh, the hydrogen buses that are based out in Palm Springs. Yeah, we're gonna get to, um, we'll get to that lar later, larger but, vehicles in a minute. Yeah. Um, what's your day-to-day -day like? Um, Driving a million miles, um, that so, must be out on um, the freeway. Professionally, the I drive about 50,000 miles a year. Personally, I drive about 20,000 miles a year. 
Uh, a day in the life of means I could drive anywhere from 100 to 400 miles. Could be local routes, just all in LA County. Could be multi-county county routes running me from San Diego up to Santa Barbara uh, and back to Torrance, uh, which is where I'm based. Um, so that's the driving part of it. Then, uh, unlike in the past with a lot of, of written work, uh, I'm basically babysitting a lot of expensive equipment, uh, which mm. in some cases is more expensive than the car itself. Uh, so that data is downloaded at the end of the day and then goes to a server, and that's what the engineers analyze. Um, I do still, of course, write reports you know, digitally on a phone. And then in the case of the hydrogen industry, uh, what the focus is now is really more on the infrastructure than the cars. Yeah. The cars have been bulletproof yeah, for a long that's time. That's what I thought, that you didn't really test. The, they've already done that like in circles and tracks. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the track driving and all that, I mean, the, the cars really are super reliable. Yeah. I mean, more reliable than gasoline cars, actually, and uh, much easier to maintain. Uh, but it's really the developing infrastructure. So just a few years ago when I began this, there were no public stations. There yeah, right. were just pr the stations you know, in police yards, municipal yards, things of that nature. Um, uh, at one at the AQMD that's been there for many years, or research sites like Berkeley or UCI, those go back about 15 years. But when we had the first public stations at the beginning of 2015, we had one in West Sacramento, and then we had one down here in Southern California out at AQMD. Uh, those were the only two public stations, and that was the beginning of 2015. We're only in 2017. Uh, they started to grow, you know, two, three, four, five. Uh, we just crossed 30 in the last 12 hours or so. Two more stations opened up uh, today, basically. Well, one at the end of yesterday, one this morning. So basically in the last 24 hours, we've opened two more stations and hit 30. Mm -hmm. And then it, you can graph it out from there, but it gets... I think there's rapid. one in La Cunada, right? There is. The two nearest here are La Cunada and South Pasadena. So besides the people that I know that are in the industry and work for the car companies or one of the hydrogen mm -hmm. providers, I have seven friends now that drive hydrogen cars, uh, mm -hmm. some of whom live locally here. And they fuel either at South Pasadena or at uh, La Cunada, or when they're out and about. Because we basically have the state of California covered, because you have Harris yeah. Ranch in the middle, Santa Barbara over there, so you can go up the coast, or you can go up I-5, connect to Northern California. There's a whole base of stations up there, a base of stations here. What's the range of a, a They start zone? The first car to come out uh, commercially was a Hyundai in 2014, June of 2014. Uh, that had a range of about mid-200s. The next car to come out was a Toyota, Toyota Mirai. That's about 300-mile range. That was in 20, uh, late 2015. Late 2016, the Honda came out. That is in the mid 300s, so you can see the trend. Yeah. Uh, the next car most likely will be the Mercedes. It'll be a, a hybrid of a plug-in battery car and a hybrid, so it'll be able to operate either way. That was due out later this year. It's probably gonna be next year. So, and then you have a bunch of other manufacturers waiting in the wings with product that's pretty much almost ready to go. So, yeah, so where does hydrogen come from? Well, hydrogen could be made as clean or as dirty as you want. I mean, you could make hydrogen from coal. It would be kind of counter to the purpose. Right. Um, so California, how is it California now has a requirement, and California is currently the only state, although they're developing an infrastructure in New, in New England, uh, although Hawaii is probably going to beat them to the punch. I just read that recently. So Hawaii will probably be the next state. But in California, of the 30 stations that we have, they're required to be 33% from renewable sources. Mm -hmm. So of the existing ones, uh, there's a handful that are pure renewable. Riverside on the way out to Palm Springs are 100% renewable, generated on site. You can make it from solar, electrolysis, a number of different ways, uh, methane steam reformation. So there's a variety of ways that you can make hydrogen. And you, like, as I said before, it could be made as clean or as dirty as you choose. Yeah. We've had a number of vehicles that had graphics on them, you know, powered by the sun. Those particular vehicles only had hydrogen that had been made from solar. Yeah, it's kind of like the, the question of electric cars as well. Right. Is you could have an electric car, but it, it could be power, powered by a coal a coal fired, fired plant. plant. <laughs> yeah. So you're sort of you're you're all you're doing is you're just pushing down uh, the. Um, uh, the contamination, you're just, it's at the source as opposed right. to from the tailpipe. Right. Um, so how, 
I, I think that um, electric and uh, hydrogen are, mm -hmm. are fantastic and they're going to help clean our um, our environment, mm -hmm. but um, don't we have to do some other things too? In, we do, but I'll make a couple of distinctions. Uh, for example, with battery technology, it's getting better all the time, but you still need a bigger battery to have more range. Uh, batteries have a lot of things in them that aren't too kind to the environment. You mean for an electric car? For an electric car. Like a, like a Tesla, yeah. everybody's familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, or a Chevy Bolt, the new Bolt. Yeah. Uh, so if you want more range, bigger battery, so it becomes a heavier and heavier battery. It, at some point, kind of becomes counterproductive. I mean, you could have a very long range if you had a very heavy battery, but then there's a lot of things that are contained in the battery mm -hmm. that aren't so great. And then, not to mention the weight, and then the weight, of course, reduces the efficiency. Uh, hydrogen is one of the lightest elements, you know, on Earth, and so you can have a, all of your tanks filled with hydrogen and it weighs virtually nothing. Um, so you're not, if you want to add more range, it's pretty simple. You have tubes basically that store the, uh, the gaseous hydrogen. You can just add more tubes as opposed to adding big heavy batteries. Uh, the way to think of it, to make it very simple and not go into like an engineering definition of it, is you have an electric motor in a hydrogen car right. um, and then you basically are charging it by putting in that gaseous hydrogen and then that gaseous hydrogen uh, goes through the, a process that converts it to electricity to run the electric motor. So rather than at night coming home and plugging in or going to a supercharger station, um, it's scalable in an already familiar uh, gas station environment. Right. So this is why, for example, Shell was one of the lead um, funders of a recent consortium uh, with some of the major automotive manufacturers, car uh, motorcycle manufacturers, hydrogen providers, but Shell was one of the leads uh, in providing an $11 billion fund to develop hydrogen. That's a lot of money. I mean, in the past, much of this has been done through government money, which is slow money. Uh, private money, which is faster, is where we're getting to now. Uh, so when you see things now, uh, when people are talking in amounts in B, billion, versus M, million, uh, it accelerates things. Oh. So, you know, there's a couple of tech companies which will go unnamed up north, very interested that have, I mean, the amount of free cash that they have could easily underwrite many, many stations. Uh, there's a, uh, a trucking company that's looking at developing 800 stations uh, nationwide. Yeah. Uh, there's a multinational in Europe that is uh, considering a thousand stations. You know, these are the yeah. kinds of scale yeah, two, two observations as you're mm -hmm. um, going through that. One is, yes, absolutely, it, it looks like pretty much the same sort of a system. I've been to the station up in La Cunada, mm -hmm. and it's just another fuel pump. That exactly. It, it, it's, it's regular, exactly unleaded, thing. or hydrogen. Yeah, and you right. just uh, stick it in, although they separated it instead of putting it in At most stations, it's concept. currently that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, but not I, all. But I think you're right as far as behavior. People right. will just drive up, and it's an Arco. They'll just drive into the Arco, yep. and they'll pull out the hydrogen holster uh, instead of the diesel one or the gas one, right. and they'll just put it in their car. So I think behaviorally, that's going to be great. Right, and I think in the adoption period, that's, that's key, is to get people, when you're trying to go to a really new tech, it's not a new technology, a new old technology, um, not having it be in any way frightening or, oh, that's tech, I don't do tech, but if pretty much everybody knows how to squeeze a handle, and they've de yeah. designed the nozzles to look and feel very similar to a gasoline nozzle, so that the experience for the customer is similar to filling up a but, car. But I want to go back to yeah. what what is the advantage if, if hydrogen is created from uh, dirtier um, origins, mm -hmm. then, then how is it that much Emissions. more? Emissions, well, two things, well, one thing, um, nobody, well, with the exception of Australia, but nobody's seriously considering coal for hydrogen. Okay. Um, so that's so hydroelectric or um, so it's it's you know solar uh, solar uh, wind. I mean, there's a variety of different ways. For example, California has excess capacity in solar now. Uh, that would be wonderful to be able to use that for um, generation of hydrogen. Uh, every time I drive out to Palm Springs and I drive by all the windmills, I think. Hmm, that could be generating hydrogen. So, uh, yes, you still are creating something, and there's a bunch of other issues, but if we look at only, if we isolate the emissions part of it, 
you know, I was born and raised here in Pasadena, married here, buried, will be buried here, literally. Um, hopefully not soon. Hopefully not soon. Um, You've got a few more miles to go. A few more miles to go. Uh, but the thing about um, having uh, the automotive technology sector available, um, sorry, um, oh, the emissions, the emissions, uh, having that available. Um, well, oh. you were saying that the at, at the very least the emissions from hydrogen yeah. cars is a demonstrable, is a significant difference from. Well, what's it's going not on. demonstrable. It's zero versus anything else. Yeah, yeah. So okay. actually, sorry, that's, that's what I was getting. Yeah, demonstrable. So getting back to growing up here, I mean, I have permanent lung damage. That's oh, one from of the things. Smog alerts. Yes, from smog alerts. Growing up here in the '60s, being uh, in in a time and a space where we had smog alerts and you had smog days and you stayed home from school. When that all happened, um, I developed some lung conditions which are permanent. And so that actually spurred my interest in the environmental movement. And so with being able to completely remove the emission side of it, you still have the production side of it and we can work on making that cleaner. But being in a space where you have zero emissions, the only emission from a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle is water vapor. So you could literally drink the tail, not a good idea, but you could. It is literally clean enough that you could drink it. I would not get near the tailpipe of yeah. any other vehicle. So, so let's talk a little bit more about motivation. Mm -hmm. And so why, what is the, the motivation? So um, for companies, there are a few factors. One is consumer demand. Right. Another one is legislation or government oversight. Mm -hmm. And then a third one is um, just business acumen or business analysis of, of the trends or how maybe um, they can make uh, a, cons a profit in the future. And maybe, right. maybe some technologies are not. What would and, you say and is I driving think, the I change here? I think it's uh, initially it was being driven more from the governmental or quasi-governmental side. You know, there were a lot of uh, governmental or quasi-governmental agencies that were trying to drive this. Um, and, you know, like anything, when it's at the inception stage, uh, it can be hard to get people that already are sort of entrenched in their business model to consider something new when they're already making a lot of money in, in the carbon industry, basically. Yeah. Um, that Very is changing. Difficult. And, and that's something that we see, I mean, somebody like Shell, for example, would not be committing the capital that they are, or Toyota and Honda, two of the giants. They're betting billions on this technology. So the ability to have, um, you know, major corporations, uh, both on the automotive side and the hydrogen provider side, be involved, as well as still having the government funding for, for a consumer, for example, right now, if you buy a car, there are a lot of subsidies. I mean, you're getting a $5,000 check from the like state. Like you bought the Toyota Mir Mirai? Toyota Mirai, you bought a Honda Clarity, a Hyundai Tucson, any of the three that are currently available, you get your $5,000 check from the state, nothing to do with the automotive dealership. You get all of your fuel provided free, which is not a workable business model long term. But for now, it certainly incentivizes people to drive the car. They did that with the electric vehicle, too. Yes, so. yeah. So it's a similar type of thing. So if you're getting free fuel and free maintenance, and all three of the manufacturers are doing this, so it's not unique to any one of them. Uh, and then they're giving you a rental car allowance each year so that if you need to go out of town or to a different state, that's paid for. So uh, there are a lot of subsidies involved at this stage. But of course, free fuel doesn't work long term, and Shell wouldn't be investing billions in it to give out free fuel. But they can see, you know, if you really take a long-term view, uh, you're going to realize that however you look at whenever peak oil is or was, at some point it's a finite resource. Um, hydrogen is not its the most common element. If we run out of hydrogen, we have much greater problems Issues. to worry about. <laughs> so, um. Um, so thinking a little bit differently mm -hmm. about consumer demand, mm -hmm. um, it's since you sit and drive them and you've driven McLarens and you've right. driven um, you know some high performance vehicles how do they perform I mean would well are and I mean you the could street, are they going to want to buy them or? they are and I think they you can see that in in looking at the spectrum that's being currently developed I mean right now you have a couple of sedans the Honda and the Toyota you have an SUV the Hyundai so kind of typical family cars uh, but there are motorcycle manufacturers that are developing fuel cell motorcycles to capture the two-wheel market. Uh, there are literally hydrogen fuel cell radio control cars. I mean, it's scaled down to that level. Um, 
And uh, on the far end, getting back to my high performance routes, Pininfarina has a, a hydrogen fuel cell supercar over 200 miles an hour, not street legal, it's a track car. But if you can afford a car over $3 million, the fact that you only drive on a track is probably okay. Yeah. But yeah, you so can probably you probably buy a track or yeah, rent you can, it. You yeah, can you can lease a track, lease a track uh, and write it off. So, you know, you basically have the whole spectrum. So I think being able to appeal to whatever people might want, whether it's a family vehicle or a sports car yeah. or a motorcycle, uh, and then all the other modes of transport that will gradually be yeah. hydrogenized. Well, and that's what I want to talk about before we run out of time is, sure. so one of the difficulties with some of the alternative fuels mm -hmm. is, is scale. So right. you can get a, a Prius Mm -hmm. um, to go just fine on a hybrid, and you can get um, you know smaller vehicles on electric motors. Although Tesla is doing really really well, right? But but how do you how do you build that up to like a semi truck? Um, well, can, can they, they it's, do that? Well, they can and they have. So the first one really to market uh, has been Toyota. Uh, that was under wraps for for a long time. They came out publicly a few months ago. Had a big to do at the port here in Los Angeles. Uh, they recently had another event at the port last week, actually, with uh, people from the city and the state and whatnot. Uh, so they have a working, functioning prototype of a big rig that can pull 80,000 pounds. And uh, if you YouTube it, you can find they drag race that against a traditional diesel truck. Really? Yeah. And the hydrogen truck basically spanks the diesel truck. So if you're a car guy, it's fun to watch yeah. the high, the, completely silently, I might add, because there's no yeah. sound and no, and no, emission. no emission. Well, there's a small plume of, yeah. of vapor. But I mean, to see this completely silent car, or in this case, truck, big rig, just pull away is really something else. And to know that it can pull 80,000 pounds doing that. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, and, and so talking about um, the smog alerts and mm -hmm. talking about the contamination in the air in LA, especially in the 70s and 80s. Right. Um, Trucks are still, I mean, we've done huge so much component. with, uh, again, the, the hybrids and, and some of mm -hmm. the electric vehicles and, and the technology with the catalytic converter and mm -hmm. then diminishing even uh, regular cars' emissions. Right. But it's the trucks that are still a huge component. Right, and there was a, a, a big push with the, I forget what it's called, but the Clean Ports Program or whatever yeah. between Long Beach and Los Angeles, and they've cleaned it up a lot, but it still has a long way to go. And it also disproportionately impacts low-income communities, and there's a whole bunch oh. of other issues. Uh, but we are now on the cusp of having not only Toyota, which is just first to market with their proof of concept, but a number of other major truck manufacturers and automotive manufacturers that are looking to get into the trucking business. So there are a whole bunch of folks uh, that are ready to release that. And then one pure clean sheet design company that would have a high, that's the one I mentioned before, they would have their own, um, they're going to roll out, their intention is to roll out 800 stations that would be available right. not only to their for trucks, fueling. Nikola, for fueling, yeah. but to all consumers as well. So that would be a, a, you know, a double benefit. Because Yeah, um, do you think that there'll be any incentives for truck, because a lot of truck drivers are independent mm -hmm. or they're small companies. Right. And those trucks are really expensive. And they drive them 200,000, 300,000. I have an uncle who drove his truck's 300,000 at least uh, right. miles. Um, is, are, do you think there'll be incentives for them to be able I to, do, to and also, switch out the old trucks? I think there will be incentives. Um, and I think one of the things in addition to that is the maintenance, the reduced maintenance that you'll have on a hydrogen big rig. It's a much simpler system, the fuel cell and the electric motor versus a large turbo diesel type motor. Mm -hmm. So the ability to go a long time with a simple fuel cell stack and a simpler electric motor, I think. Also, it may be a, a looking at a life cycle cost thing where you may have a little bit higher up front, but the life cycle cost could be reduced uh, in the mm -hmm. same way that say CHP analyzed motorcycles many years ago, bought a more expensive motorcycle, but the overall life cycle cost ended up being smaller. Yeah, so what is the, the portal system and how is that functioning? So portal system is actually a name for that proof of concept that Toyota developed. And uh, that just went live this month in August. So that truck is currently driving around the, the port area. Uh, it is a truck of one. 
Um, and as I said, there are many other manufacturers that are eager to get in on this, both on the trucking side and the automotive side. Are you going to switch to test driving trucks now? I like cars. <laughs> so I, I mean, that's, that's what, what gives me joy and in, in how I got into this. So probably won't switch to getting a are, Class are, A license. Are there so many um, technological gizmos that you have to mm -hmm. be paying attention to that you can't like listen to the radio? What do you do while you're driving? No, do actually you? I do listen to the radio. Uh, thank heaven for satellite radio because if I had to listen to terrestrial radio, AM, FM, that would be the death of me. But, but with satellite radio, you have it nearly unlimited mm -hmm. in terms of listening to business radio, political talk radio, music of every possible genre. So I have that. I mean, there are times, of course, depending on what I'm doing, that I can't listen to the radio. But the majority of the time, I do have the ability to do that. So one last sort of thought is, what is your, how are you feeling about the future of transportation and thus its impact on the environment? And, and are you feeling like we're, we're making strides quickly enough? I do. Now I do. If you'd asked me that just a few years ago, I would have said that I was a little concerned because it seemed like, you know, hybrids were great. But it's kind of a stopgap. Yes, we get better mileage, but we're still burning fossil fuels. Uh, and I think kind of as we're in this immediate stage and all of the above strategy where we're driving hybrids and the new plug-in hybrids that can run either as a pure electric or a hybrid, um, the pure battery EVs like the Tesla or the Chevy Bolt, and then now um, ushering in the hydrogen cars. But I can see going forward where we could have a zero emission future where we have unlimited supply, we never need to go outside of domestic to, to get that. Right. supply. Um, and so I'm much more positive now than I was only a few short years ago. Yeah, th there could be some instability as we switch off of oil, though. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, especially in the Middle East, a lot of dependence economically oh, yeah. on, on oil. Yeah, the geopolitical implications are pretty significant. I mean, that's not my field, but I mean, I know enough to know that the impact could be pretty major because, I mean, there have been yeah. entire nations that are built on oil money and if that were to cease to exist, that would change things significantly. Yeah. But maybe like Shell, they should be getting into um, investing in new technologies. And so right, that, that would and kind of, kind of reframing it and thinking in terms of being the energy business and yeah. not just the dead dinosaur business. Uh, yeah. I mean, energy-wise, uh, if you're out in the middle of the desert, for example, in the, in the Middle East, there's a lot of sun. You know, so if you're thinking of the ability to convert solar into other forms, you know, there you go. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for making the time to be here you today. You bet. Thank it's you very much. Fantastic, and um, I wish you the very, very best. All right. In uh, your testing. So thanks, thanks much. A lot, Tom. Thanks, Brian. All right.